All righty then, let's hope technologically I am very sound and ready to go for 2021. We're kicking it off with a little bump and a, a grind here on uh, social. We had to get the link working again, and it looks like we did because I'm seeing you all rolling here. So uh, happy new year officially from the sales training call end of things and um, looking forward to getting after today. Now, of course, rules of engagement for 2021 are the same as they are uh, every year that, you know, you try to be respectful here that we have a lot of people on the call and we want to get to as much help as we can. I really would like to make 2021 a much better balance on the sales training call between what we do as far as outside sales versus telemarketing or inside sales. They're both extremely important to the consumer consistent, predictable flow in the real estate agent business, as we know, but we tend to spend a lot of time talking about telemarketing. And that's simply because I don't have enough of you outside sales agents in attendance asking me questions. Now, having said that, I go through great lengths to try to fumble and stumble before every call. I am live on every channel that the Realty Classroom has. If you were on the Realty Classroom YouTube channel, if you were on the, the TRC Facebook page, you're going to see this broadcasting. And the software that I use is called StreamYard. I can see a comment from anywhere, right? <clears throat> Live, it's right in front of me. And obviously, those of you that have been invited into the private Zoom, you can be asking questions verbally because the sound is here right? Or in the chat, which is a little bit more difficult. And I like to keep the chat quiet. Autumn always does a great job at trying to give her play by play, but I'm the coach. I expect you to ask me and I expect you to have supplementary help in any of these chats. Okay. So you ask me the question, I will give you my best advice to make you successful and give you something actionable um, as we talk through this whole thing, okay? So I'm going to throw a monkey wrench in this because I'm going to go. Um, I think there was a couple of you I asked to be here. And if I did, speak now. If I asked you to bring up something here because I have too many things happen between when I tell you to do that now, um, let me know if we had something to, to talk about. Anybody I told to be right here in first place? No? Okay. Hearing none, you're all slow. I'm going to go right away. I'm looking for an outside sales challenge. And if I have to get that outside sales challenge from one of my mastermind members, then that's where I'll take it from. Okay. So I'm looking for an outside sales challenge. And that could be when you go out on some of these appointments that have been given to you. So um, let's see who steps up here first with an outside sales challenge. That's what I want. In the meantime, I'm going to continue to try to Straighten out my screens here. All right, come on. I've got all my mastermind members. Let's go. Kleba, you're not killing every deal. I know that. Kyle Jones, uh, Jenny Swalik. Jenny, I've never called you Jenny. Like my daughter, Jennifer. Um, all right, so uh, let's go. Who's up? Can you guys all unmute yourselves if you're there? Just so I know somebody's there. I'm not hearing anything from any of you. I'm here. There we go. There we go. All right, Jen, I'll put you in the hot seat. Biggest sales challenge is what? Let's deal with it. Outside sales. Biggest sales uh, challenge for me so far has been um, dealing with, like I told you, a divorced couple where one's more difficult than the other. One's more on board than the other one is. Yeah. Okay. And so let's talk about that because you've done a good job in getting that, you know, under control per se. So I'm proud of that. You did a good job. Um, what are the challenges you can foresee going forward in, in that situation? What happens going forward? Um, in this deal or yeah. going no, in this deal, in this deal. And let's just give everybody a little bit of a background. It's a divorced couple. The wife's been very easy to deal with the husband, not so much. Although over time, I think you should talk about that a little bit without getting into the intimate details of it. But how do you corral somebody when you have two different parties that are divorced? Or, and, and how do you corral somebody back in? What did you do? And I want you to talk through it. So it gets rooted in you. What did you do to get this under control per se? Good question. I think what I did all along was that I, I, I stuck to when everything started, anything started to go off the rails with the party that wasn't always on board. Um, I brought everything back to the plan mm -hmm. to show where we were in the steps and what needed to happen. Um, and the biggest part of that plan that worked for me throughout this whole process was the communication stage with the feedback from the, you know, the 45 people that came through the house 
over time and helped me help him see the light mm -hmm. and helped me help him realize how I wasn't the enemy. I was the helper mm -hmm. and I, I helped them get to a point where they could both move on. And, um, that ended up being very powerful, I think, for him yeah. and also for me. So when you're under attack like that, it's easy to get mad. It's easy to say, you know, oh, well, if he's not going to appreciate me, you know, all that stuff that we tend to do. But my question to you is when you say you made him know that you weren't the enemy, try to think back specifically to advice uh, that I would have given you that we, and I'm not sitting here patting myself on the back by no, any no. means. I'm simply saying, you know, what parts of the advice in the conversation did we have that led you to a situation where you were able to make him feel that way try to be specific in what it was hmm, it's a good question i'm trying to think it just feels like it's been such a long process i can't right but this is and this is why it's important to autopsy and i know you're still in the but middle of the deal I just can't think. yeah yeah well let me let me cheat to the witness let me lead the witness a little bit okay. right I, I i i think when originally we went to this property the thing that struck you the most was how much, because it was that first live time where I went with you to teach you in the heat of the moment what it looks like to walk through a simple process of, hey, thanks so much for having us over. Do you mind giving us the nickel tour? Can we sit down across from each other somewhere after the nickel tour, we say? Uh, what's most important to you? She gets a cathartic moment. Great, we have a seven-step system. We just want to explain to you a little bit. Then we'll get into the math. Um, take me all the way back to what you witnessed there. Try to go back for a ride in your mind to that moment in time and, and what you learned and what you thought about that moment. Well, I, I learned that this person had been led around by four other agents in the past when the house was listed previously um, and had never been empowered in the process, that it was just wasn't her, it wasn't her business to be in the process. Mm -hmm. And the moment that we showed her that, no, this is your process. This, you are a part of it. You're an important part of it. You, we are partnering together to do this. The relief in her was amazing. Yep. And it made me realize that that's, you have to empower the client as well to feel like they are part of this so that they're with you throughout the process. And yeah. that to me was big. Yeah. Good. So, so talk, so when you say that happened to her, what, what, what was big? Like what happened to her in that moment? She was relieved. She almost cried, right? She had a, actually a physical reaction to it. T tell me a little bit about that. What, what would, you know, what, when you go back and analyze it, what happened I there? I realized that we were the, that we, she was finally in good hands. Yeah. I think she realized that finally that there, there really is a path and that she was finally on the right path. So simply put, you restored hope. Yes. Okay. Exactly. But how? Dig in deeper and unpack it. How did you restore hope, do you think? What was the difference? I mean, anybody could go in and give confidence. Let's say a confident orator walks into the house and says, I can do this. And a lot of people do do that, right? And they have no clue about a system or a process. Tell me what it was about the way we did it beyond just the way we said it, that proved it to her in that moment. What do you think, if anything, there, there was validation and it wasn't just words? In that moment or going forward? Yeah, in that moment, right in that moment. Um, well, I feel like I, from the infographic, going through the infographic um, and laying out a plan for at that moment as what we're gonna do going forward, even not even on the infographic, but saying this is what my plan is, this is what, you know, this is what we're gonna do in the next week, the next two weeks. Um, I don't know, I just, I feel like it laid down a ground, some groundwork for her. Like someone said before in Mastermind about the well-lit path, mm -hmm took her off the dark road and put her on the well-lit path. And for the first time she could see that there actually was the light just, I, and I think it's just by you and I sitting there talking to her and listening to her and, and taking the time with her that no one ever had taken with her before. Right. And it's empowerment, right? They right. become, they become what, what you're talking about is you're restoring hope through the fact that you actually have a plan. It feels like a well-lit path, like Allison Egan is the one to give credit. She said that. It feels like a well-lit path to them. And suddenly they're not lost in the woods because they're hiding it from you, right? Suffice to say that most people are hiding their true emotions in that moment about how they really feel about this particularly when there's a, a distress sale. And I don't mean the physical property. I mean, the feeling of the human being, they have distress. And in this case, it being um, a, a, um, a divorce, it's very distressful. And we were what number agents 
agency number in five. there? Yeah, number five. So, so, and they tried everything. And so there's this exasperating moment where hope is almost lost, right? right. Right. And, and, and it doesn't even have to be that extreme, but in this case, it's a good anecdote because it is an extreme, right? So now you look at it, you say, all right, well, well, look, let's, let's go a little step further here. Um, it goes on and it continues. And then what, what happens from there? Because there are other breakdowns. So we have this plan. Everybody's hunky dory. The minute you walk out the door, there's a crescendo and there's a peak moment of uh, there's hope, but then it doesn't go that smoothly. Right. Right. So, right. so when did you run into your first problem? I think my, if I can go back on it and look and say hindsight's 2020, I think that my first mistake was I didn't then take that plan that we did and go to the other side, the other partner, yeah. the other the ex-spouse and go through the same exact thing with him because he tried to take control right away and it was a power issue, power yeah. struggle. Yeah. Um, but you know, I just, I just stuck to the plan. I stuck to exactly what we said we were going to do. And um, I think that those steps made every time he was off the rails and he was out of control and he was trying to take control over, it gave me back the ability to do my job because I stuck to what we said we were going to do and it was working. Okay, good. So, so now you go back in time, you would have sat down and done the exact same thing to all decision makers, which becomes an important takeaway for outside sales agents in every situation. Um, let's go to the buy side of something as well, especially if any of you are in the first time home buyer, there are other consultants, we will call them nicely today, in these people's lives, not the least of which are their parents, who are going to weigh in with all sorts of opinions, right? And so you have to root out early on who the decision makers are and what role they're playing, right? Because those are the people that absolutely 100% should be included and empowered. And, and that way, by including them, you can bring them down a level right? You can bring them down a level, meaning meaning they're not trying to so so much control this as they are feeling like they're, most people that are trying to collide with you in a situation, you just haven't included. So talk about when you began to include him in the process. Um, and, and especially for a lot of women running up against a strong male persona um, who, who won't defer to you, because that's what this is. It's not a sexist comment. It's the reality of the business, right? You ran up against a male persona who is, you know, in a struggling spot in life with a divorce, et cetera. And so where did you break through in that relationship and how did you do it? Um, well, I, I feel like when I, I, when I realized that the power struggle, I didn't own it. It was his internal struggle, not mine. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't really about me in terms of him. It wasn't him like about me. It was his own things that he had inside. I've, figure out how to shift how I was coming about it and bringing him more into the process. And every time I had a showing, every time I had something going on or a, an agent call about it or anything, I included him in all of that. And I would send him a text and I would say, this is what's going on. I wanted to keep you in the loop. He soon realized that I wasn't a threat. I was a help. I'm working hard. I'm going to help him out. And he slowly started to come around. And when we had the first offer, we went to us he really gained confidence in, in me and in the process and in the system. Now take yourself back to this, the, where you're at in this deal and still a live deal. So everybody knows if you join late, Jen Swalik, one of our uh, agents is talking about a, a deal that she's involved in. If I take you back into this deal and I ask you to take the tough moments that you had, you pick the very first crisis moment you had when you had dealt a, a doubt, anger, frustration, what was the first moment you had? Let's define a couple of crisis moments because you told me how you fixed it with him, but it wasn't before you had some crisis moments. Name right. the first one along the continuum that you can remember. The first one was the first offer that came in, which we thought you and I, I thought was a great offer because it had um, con no inspection contingency. It had you no know, house as is the buyer's agent who was a friend waived their um, commission. So you don't ever get that on, a, I would think on a million press property. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was a good deal. And 
in the process of going back and forth and, and negotiating and renegotiating. And when they, when they, when my sellers turned it down, I felt very, I got frustrated and I got frustrated. I, I got frustrated at my, maybe my ability. And I got, I got emotional. I, I, I made it about me, not about them. Mm -hmm. And I called you extremely frustrated about that. And, um, you know, you had to talk me down from that and talk me through it because I said at that point, I've done the best I can do. I don't know much, how much more I can do. And it was like, no, I had to ground myself back and see it through their lens, not my lens. Yeah. Good. Um, <clears throat> is it easy to, to, to not make it about you or is it difficult? For me right now in the stage I'm at in, in, being only in it a year, it's, it's difficult. I, I, I want to do the best for, I want everybody to be happy and I put that on myself. So mm -hmm. I, I have to learn and you've said it and we talked about it this week is to stick to the facts, stick to the facts. I have to have care. Obviously they're my clients, but always stick to the facts. Mm -hmm. Don't go on, on emotions. Mm -hmm. As a caring human being, which is why a lot of us do this job, um, is it an, almost an impossibility to, to make it about just them? I mean, how do you, how do you reconcile those two differences? You want to make it about your client, especially in a distress sale, but yet you feel affronted when somebody, uh, assumingly puts you down, presumably they put you down, right? It wasn't about, that's right. Look, it wasn't about me, but what I was upset about was I thought this was the best out for them. And I didn't want them to get hurt in the long run. So I was frustrated. Yeah. But as it turned out, we waited a little while longer and now we have a, a hopefully better deal and it's under contract. So it did work out. But at that moment, I was scared it wasn't going to. And they were going to look back and regret it. And that made me feel bad. And there were, was and there were, uh, let me name a second crisis. I think there was a moment in time where the listing was expiring. Yeah. And, and there was, and I was telling you, you need to go face to face here because even, even your strongest part of the relationship with the wife was beginning to be attacked by outside forces, which this is a very dirty business in a lot of ways, right? Very dirty because when you take decent people, I'm not going to call them good. I'll call them decent people um, who are desperate to make a living, get a sale. They're going to demean you even if they don't think they are. So a lot of agents that would run into a client who then begins to vent, hey, have you seen my house? It's for sale with Jen and blah, blah, blah. It's not sold yet, said this agent, right? I had another agent tell one of my clients, uh, Paul, he told him, you know, I've got three people. When's it coming on? I got, he never showed up. And I told Paul, Paul, stop. Tell him to stop talking too, okay? I know him. To, to, like, stop. You're my client. We're listing it. You're my past client. And he doesn't have three people. I'll guarantee right. you because he doesn't do enough deals a year to prove that he's got three people for just your price range. Well, suffice to say he didn't at all. And he never showed up for a single showing. And I said, remember what I told you, Paul? Now I happen to be showing another one of my high end properties with this guy. So it's not like I wanted to get in a fight with him. And that's why I say this business has a strange way of, of compromising decent people. So you have to also understand that, but it, it became for you a crisis moment because well, yeah, go ahead. Right? Come on. Come on. Like you said to me, I had to coach her. She had people saying to her, you know, why hasn't your house? Lived? I could have sold that by now, or I could have. And so you had to teach me how to coach her in those moments to say to her, great, bring a buyer. If you have a buyer, bring them by, Get, call Jen. Or she had agents saying, Hey, let me just come take a look at your house. Let me just come take a look around. Even though she's under contract with me, they were trying to get in to look at the house to see if, because they could do it better. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so she felt powerless and embarrassed at those moments. And, and you know, you coached me on how to coach her and, and that really worked. So what did you do? Because I think that's a huge moment for everybody here. I mean, we talk a lot on this call with the telemarketers about expired listings. And there's just like, you know, a lot of this is because even the first agent goes in and over promises and never really comes in with a plan, which is why we make a huge deal in the sales training call. Stick to the simple seven step plan to empower them because you're going to need it. And I'm going to come to this in a second. You're going to need to refer back to it, not just introduce it, right? And it is the thing that uniquely keeps people in a mode with you where they make the appropriate adjustments that they need to make, right? So, so speak to that. What did so we, my, what did my, we talk about? To her was, you know, okay, 
um, when someone says those things to you, first of all, ask them, great, do they have a buyer? If you have a buyer, that's fantastic. You know, have, call Jen, give them my information. Yeah. Um, and to put them on the spot. Um, and when people were asking to come in to see the house, um, I would, she would say to them, you know, I, I'm working with Jen and I'm not comfortable having someone in the house without Jen present. So if you'd like to make it, you know, an appointment, then. Oh, so you want to preview the house? I'll have Jen call you. Let me have right. one of your business cards. And again, I think coaching your client of what, like where the attacks will come from is, is a big takeaway for you now, right? right. I'm not right. saying that we don't want to border on sounding like this weird paranoia um, who, who's going to go out and say, now, just like you're going to, you might have it, anybody that calls you. Sometimes agents can be overzealous. Sometimes people can try to, you just funnel everybody my way. Okay. I, you hired me for a reason and that's to funnel and vet everybody, their seriousness of purpose, their ability to perform. That's all going to be part of this, this phase that we get to that we call communication slash market making. A lot of weird things can happen then and you can get emotional. So when you're going through that seven steps, that's the point about bringing them back to that. So as you near the end of this and you were under attack, the idea is to go back face to face and start again and anew with your client. Reset. Say, look, we've made some good progress here. We have found out that we were, were able to, we priced it well enough based on the system that you listened to where we were able to get 30 showings Okay, that's great news. We we're able to get one offer. Unfortunately, it didn't come together. But that's a great, we're far better off now than you have been in the four years you're trying to sell it. So now we just have to make a few more tweaks and adjustments. And unfortunately, it's going to take a little bit more time, but that's the reality. But you connect them to the progress that has been made. Whereas most agents will withdraw in that moment. And you began to do it because when you fall back into that natural default, it's about us and how we feel. You began to say, well, I can hold my head up high because I didn't. Whoa. Like you're, you're already pulling the ripcord mentally to defend your own reputation versus leaning back in and saying, all right, I haven't done everything that I can do. Still might get fired because I might be caught up in such an emotional situation that, that I, there's nothing I can do. I wasn't able to get it done before the sand, sand in the hourglass was gone. But you went back in and you grabbed the bull by the horns. You got her back under control because she's your number one ally. And then you were able to keep him in check because what's he going to do? Upset the apple cart and go where? He's not even living in the house, right? So the order of things and the restarting of things became very important. And instead of getting emotional and throwing the tantrum that we all throw when it's not going our way, Laura and I talk about this all the time. I mean, with multiple deals going on at any one point in time, we always want to throw a tantrum. We always default to self, especially when you're tired and cranky, right? And it's a long, a, a long way going. But the reset moment is, I was doing a podcast this weekend and the reset moment is that 60 second break. <sighs> Big breath. Think about it. How could I serve her in this moment? How could I serve him better in this moment? And you go to those moments where you're serving, right? And, and then you really have done what you could do, but it's a resetting of that servant's mentality to get back up underneath them and lift them up, right? But when you get back up on top of it and you're face to face it, well, you can't accuse me and I've done, you don't have to go through that. You just have to go through, look, let's just sit down and talk about where we're at. Okay. This is how much progress we've made. This isn't what has happened. This is what has happened. And you just reset them. And you did a brilliantly good job of that when you were able to reset. So your takeaways are you started smartly by learning the plan with me and seeing its empowering moment. You got your teeth kicked in experientially to see that you can be dragged through a house with all these agents over and over and over and have a price that's slightly off and get negative feedback and have to deal with it. That's the reality and the difficulty of the outside sales job. You learned that. Then you realize as that ticks along and you know without a price adjustment, even though it was, it wasn't a big one, you were going to have to do something to tweak it. And when you did the ultimate result began to happen where you not only had one person still circling, you created two new offers. You were able to without, and you did a really good job there because you came for help. 
between both Steve and I, I presume, right? And, and you were able to not blow up any of those relationships by being respectful to both agents, guiding them to the highest and best that was reasonable for either and getting the best one under agreement, right? So, so it proves out that the underlying plan, when you stuck to it emotionally and said, look at this is how far we are and it's requiring this. And at that point in time, because you had stuck to the plan, because there was evidence of showings, effort, they took the hardest advice, which was yet another price tweak. And they began to see the net over and over and over. And they kept defaulting in the very end. Show me, say, what did he say in the very end? Send me the net sheet, right? Let me look at the numbers. I'll call you tomorrow. And as he wrestled with them and realized this was as good as it was going to get, then then it was systematically the way you bring them to this point. Now, of course, you have to get through a home inspection, presuming that that goes well, you know, then you can get to the other side. But like I said to you, when you, by the way, when you got your big extension too, when you got an extension of time to perform this, that was a huge victory on sitting with them and telling them where they'd been and saying, it's not really a reset to zero. We're at another plateau. We just have to go here. We need more time. They gave it to you willingly because what are they going to do? Dump you who took them that far and start all over again with the unknowing, right? Sometimes they do irrationally. It's the book, Predictably Irrational. Sometimes they will act that irrationally and they will reset with somebody else if you lose your professional footing that you started with. Making sense so far? Absolutely. So now you come all the way down here. And even if you had a deal blow up on a home inspection, which, you know, Dave's struggling with one right now where we've had two home inspections, the buyers were kind of whimsical. And, and what I taught him in that moment is, Dave, look what's in front of you for real. Don't just accept a buyer who's a Boston rookie investor who's paying you full price. Eh, you think that's a good deal? And the next one's an elderly lady from Texas who hasn't really seen it and hasn't been here. Eh. You know, we always have to see what's actually in front of us. And as we switch to telemarketing this call, we have to actually listen to what's being said to us and make those adjustments. But I think that what's very important for you to understand about this is that what was always underlying for you was going back to the seven steps, seeing how far you had gotten, how much more progress you had made, and, and, and being just realistic with them about what the system was telling you both to do in that moment, right? Right. There's a process. The process is saying, I don't care how emotional you want to get, how emotional they want to get. You better listen to me, Mr. Process, right? I'm the one telling you, you're almost home and you've been following me all along. Don't everybody, you know, throw a conniption and bail out on this thing at this moment. Does that help? Yes. Because I think, Jen, that repeats itself over and over. And so it's getting layered on top of this cake. Now that you're 12 months in, by the way, happy anniversary, right? Yeah. I just noticed it came up almost to the date on LinkedIn. But it, it, now that you have that first year of experience, right, how about the very first deal where you you made it so emotional that you your, your, your business brain for margin fell out of your head and you're going to do it for free, which I liked the instinct. You were going to do it for free because supposedly this person was going to give you all these referrals in the future, right? So you go all the way from that kind of a rookie mistake, which I, I was able to prevent. And you even said, I never would have done it for only half a loaf. I would have done it for more, right? Because you realize that once you have that initial moment, oh my gosh, is there more to do, right? So much more. So you're layering the experiential cake. But if you go back even to that off-market listing, the minute you walked into your ex-sister-in-law's house, you were implementing a systematic approach. Even though it's off-market and you have a direct buyer that you can pull together off-market, the value is still in the fact that you're going to walk these people down the well-lit path so they don't get eaten by the werewolves on either side, Right. So exactly. the value never goes away. Presuming that we always reference in our mind, I have a plan for you. I have a system for you. We never devalue that. And we keep coming back to it. And it's quite frankly, your own safety net. You could have easily lost this million dollar plus listing after having done all that work if you lost yourself to emotion. 
But coming back to the plan and realizing, well, we're in the communication stage, duh, I better go over to her house and communicate what that communication and market making has really said and, and increase the hope. Say, yes, I told you we had a plan. We made it all the way down here. And it's not like, hey, well, I'm the only one that bought you 30 people. Nobody else bought you 30 people. Wah, 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 right? That's the inner child that wants to debate with them. The professional says, look, good news. I know it's not easy and I know you wish it was over, but we have made tremendous progress. Look, remember the seven steps? We've made it deeply this time into this communication phase. In fact, getting that one offer is a good start. So we're even, now we're into a stage six negotiation. We're almost there. Hang in there, right? It's going to take a little bit more time, but hang in there. And I've even got your husband on the same page with you now. Now we're close. Everybody's ranting and raving a little bit. I get it. But the reality is the reality. And that also gives you the opportunity to lean in more, more demonstratively and professionally and say, look, everybody stop. Like you hired me to do the job. I'm doing it and I'm telling you what's happening. None of the three of us can get away from this reality, right? And I think you did that well too. But always, I think the best thing you did was you understood when you got guidance from me where you were in the seven steps and you went back and recreated where you were. And I think, you know, that's where you're at. And, you know, from this point forward, you have to set them up and say, you know, let's all well, be cautious. We've got to get through the home inspection. You know, we, we you know, you know, home inspectors, they're going to want to cover their tail and nothing else. So it's going to always be difficult at this stage. So be ready. You just warm them up now. Right. You get them ready. You know, you you get them in a realistic state, not like an a, you know a, you know an over exuberant state. Right. Thoughts about that? I think that what, I just want to go back to one thing. I think that when the moment that it shifted and changed was that second sit down, um, and when I talked to sat down with her and then talked to him, yep. that was the moment where it shifted, and that was where I saw instead of them kind of being you know emotional and it's an emotional process anyway, but right. being kind of um, like telling me what to do. Not that they're, I mean, obviously I'm working for them, but where they started asking me, Jen, what do you think? And yeah. I thought that was, that was powerful. Cause you earned it. They, I, they were, they were trusting me now to say, well, I really, I value what you're, what you think. Because you earned it. And you yeah. earned it simply by, and, and again, for, to, for everybody listening to be encouraged, you just finished your first 12 months in this business. And this is a million dollar plus, And they're asking you for advice, which should empower everybody listening. For the, the, you, it doesn't matter how long you've been in it. If you're following a systematic approach and you can keep working on your professionalism or you bring it into this industry, you can compete with anybody. Let me repeat that. You can compete with anybody. Because the top producers take it from a guy who is one and has been around for a long time competing with them. A lot of people are doing business on very thin soup. I'm talking about top producers or, you know, all oh, my brands. Well, your brand doesn't sell the house. The process I take you through does. How to price it right, how to negotiate well without losing people. There are a lot of moving parts. And the, the quicker you learn those, the faster you compete with anybody, especially in the listing side. Right? Good. All right. Good job. Thank you for letting me run through that with you because I think it empowers you going forward too, that you, you just go back and, and the, even in the easy ones, I would be cognizant of where I'm at and I wouldn't take them for granted. Because remember, at the end of the day, you're trying to, trying to produce a happy past client that's likely to repeat and refer. That's the ultimate ending to this. It's not the check, right? The check is a wonderful byproduct of this because it's called a business. We have outflow of time, money, and energy, um, and, and then we have an inflow of money. And, you know, profitable is everything. But growth of the business in the long run, it's a satisfaction of the client who's easy, the client who's difficult. We, we, we need to pride ourselves on how do we finish and birth them into our past client community? Did we finish strongly? Right. And sometimes you got to go put an arm around them, even though they got the financials out. Say, I know that was rough. How you doing? You doing OK? Right. Because sometimes I go, oh, I scored for them and I got them the top dollar and they should love me. No, not true. They just came through the end of something that could be extremely emotional. Could be the, the house they raised their kids in, the house somebody passed in that they loved. I mean, they're crossing this emotional finish line. You want to make sure that you're leaving them in that moment, at least able to move forward. 
and knowing that you're their family for life, that you will continue to keep them updated on what's going on so that, that they don't feel abandoned. It's very easy for a transactional agent to leave a really good client feeling abandoned. And they wonder why, you know, that person didn't come back, didn't refer. Well, you abandoned them at the, you know, at the, at the real emotional ending. Don't do that. Finish your book and make it for life. It's like the mob. Once they're in your past client community, they're never getting out, right? Till it's a pine box, period. All right, thoughts about that, questions about that. That's a good outside sales anecdote for everybody because we use the system to benchmark against where we were at, especially in a crisis moment of potentially losing this deal. Thoughts about that from other outside sales agents, my uh, my team leaders, anybody. Let me hear from you. Man, 2021 is going to start off like that. that. Thank you. Go no, ahead, We Grant. take a lot for granted. Yeah. I like we're just, I like we're not that. enough questions are really like removing ourselves from the the process because yeah like you said this they only go through this every now and again every six seven years Grant why do you really think listen and, and make it like it's a family member a lot of times I'll throw in if you were my brother if you were my father my mother you know that yeah. kind of talk but, just, but but Grant you bring up a really good point and I'm glad you picked up on it there it, why do we take it for granted what happens to us. <laughs> Because what you, what you heard in that anecdote with her was was Jen lost, and it's wonderful to have somebody who's such an open, willing student early on when she's going through these deals because she listens to me. You know, sometimes it sucks. I'm sure she wants to punch me in the face because she's pretty tough, right? But but she 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 listens, and in that moment, you're lo you're throwing your tantrum, you're losing yourself to yourself. Why do we do that even in a softer way where we just kind of take it for granted? And that's why I mentioned an easy deal at the end. You get an easy deal and you kind of just take it for granted. It's, oh, that was easy. What's the big deal? And like, and I'm so busy. Whew, I'm glad that's easy. I don't have to talk to them that much. Why do we do that? Boy, I'm not, I mean, maybe, maybe we're not focused on them 100%. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Go, go deeper. Anybody. Why do we do we're, that? We're thinking about everything. Else. Yeah. We yeah. should be focused on them. They're pretty worthy of fiduciary. Yeah. We, we got to look after them and kind of shepherd them through this process. Yeah. Anybody else? Want to take a stab at why do we take people for granted when we're working with them, especially when it's easy? Any outside sales agents Lacking there? empathy. Dean, Kleba, Gail, you're all just staring at me on this Zoom screen. I can't see Lindsay, can't see Georgie, Kyle. Everybody's just staring at Andy. Come on, you're all just staring at me. Either that or you're not paying attention. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I wasn't paying attention. I've been I've been in and out. So uh, but uh, but I, I think <laughs> at least he had, at least at least the big jerk admits it, right? <laughs> I got no problem. Listen, I got way too many flaws. I'm not afraid to admit any and all of them. Yeah. Uh, but but I think I, I think one of the things Grant just says is, is part of it is that there's a lack of empathy. Yeah. Um, there's there's a frustration level we deal with, and and we allow ourselves to get disgusted and say, why didn't they do what we told them to do? Kind of stuff. Yeah. I think that has something to do with it. Yeah. 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 You can get mad at them. Right. That's part of the tan. That's that's part of the tantrum you can throw. What else? Anybody else? Gail, you got any opinion on this? I just had a thought Go that ahead. maybe we kind of classify everybody into baskets. Like, all right, we've all been doing this for 10, 15, whatever it might be for a while. And then they fit in this bucket. This is how I respond to them. Yeah. Maybe they're auto program kind of responses yeah. subconsciously. Yeah. Well, I totally would agree with that. I think yeah. when you're busy and you're under stress, that's how we all talk and think. We talk about that. Ironically, when you shift to telemarketing, you know, there's a, even in the scripting, Look at what I wrote. Frequently stated objections, because under stress, people hit the you know they hit the quick button and they just respond in a certain way. Ladies, you walk into a shoe store. The salesperson comes up. May I help you with something? And too aggressive. What's your response? What's your response, ladies? I'm just looking. Period. Period. Like anything. Go on a car lot. Same thing. I'm just looking because it's a defense mechanism that we deal with under stress. That's the way we do it. So let's take it from our perspective for a second. Telemarketers, outside sales agents, you're under tremendous stress. Imagine the stress Jen's feeling after six months of hard work, um, success to a certain extent with people coming through the door, even an offer written. And we feel th that success. But then all of a sudden we're on the precipice of losing it all. 
that's a tremendous stress. So we, we begin to almost get agitated and we get confrontational. How dare you? And before somebody even says to us, well, I'm going to go in another direction. We just begin to presume it and we, we become the self-fulfilling you know, um, prophecy, right? We fulfill it by our actions. Go ahead, Gail. You wanted to say something. Well, I mean, I, I'll, I'll just think about this when I'm going to respond to an email. I start right away. I start saying whatever the question is that they had for me to answer. And then I step back. It's I mean, I almost do it like 90 percent of the time. And then I step back and then I say, OK, how do I really want to write this email? Because emails don't have a lot of emotion in it. So I step back and then I become empathetic. But I, I, it's always, I always default to that. And I don't know if it's the <clears throat> high D and I in me. Uh, the I wants to be liked, of course, but um, more than that, I think that I've changed a lot in the last year in terms of people and how I see them. And, and it's a good segue. The one thing that I always tell everyone and myself, don't get angry. Anger makes you certain. And when you're certain, you don't change and you don't see the possibilities in the in the problem. Yeah, I love that. It's, I love that. I love it too. Yeah. And I, I get asked probably right now after I get done talking to you, I'll get angry about something. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's something that I work on on a daily basis. But I know that if I don't get angry and I sit for a moment and, and, and take it easy and kind of get out of that stress mode, which is so, I mean, God, it's so important to everybody. Uh, but when you're working really hard on a deal, like I did a, a transaction where a lawyer was involved, it was a, uh, and the, and the builder was with the trustee because the original, um, the original person that helped purchase with the builder died. Mm. It was a mess. And I was, I learned what great negotiation skills I had. We took away, actually, I asked both of them, what do they want? I brought in a buyer. My, my, my listing expired. I brought in a buyer um, that was, came in earlier. She said, Gail, if it wasn't for you and you following up with me, I probably wouldn't buy this house. I love it, but I wouldn't have bought it. And she said, and so what I did with both the trustee and the, um, and the builder was I said, what do you want? And what do you want? And then they came together, they wrote out what they both wanted. We made a deal and, and we sold the property uh, 24 hours before the new listing agent had the, had the, uh, the new transaction. Yeah. So I was able to do that, but that took a lot of uh, thought process and a lot of focus yeah. and a lot of caring about the people. Yeah. And it's the one thing that, I mean, I care about people. Of course, I just had my 10th great grandson today. Yesterday was born. Awesome. And he's congrats. Wonderful and yeah, awesome. Congrats. Great and news. So, you know, I got a great love for family and I feel like that's all that I can love. I mean, because I got like a soccer team, but the fact is, is that I've really changed a lot in the way that I, I feel and think. And I think it's called emotional intelligence. Yeah. So, and, you, and I think everybody has to step back. We're in a stressful world. You have to step back and think about what it is that you want, how you can help them. And it just doesn't, for, for a lot of people, it comes naturally, but it doesn't come naturally for me, yeah. but it's becoming naturally for me. Well, Maybe it did a long time ago. Things changed. Yeah. You know, I got angry, whatever. Well, but I'll tell you what, from a, well, I'll tell you what, from a sales training perspective, if you can gain emotional intelligence, not get angry, not be so certain and not, yeah. not be the cause and the root of your own problems, what you find out, it's a far more effective tactic. So if you want to appeal to the salesperson inside of everybody, the, uh, there, there's no debate that, again, I do believe that it's not just being Mrs. Nice Gal or Mr. Right. Nice Guy. I don't, I don't think it's squishy like that at all. I think people don't have tolerance for non-professional approach. In other words, telemarketers, you pick up the phone and you start babbling on with a nice tone, a really nice tone that a friend who already knows you would, would accept. You would get smashed and steamrolled on the phone. 
because you're babbling and you're non-professional in your approach. I think Jen could go in and be empathetic and nice to these folks and they would like her, but they might choose somebody else that comes in that's far less likable, but gives them the feeling that you give me the best chance to win. So, so I do believe that by combining these two things, by understanding the power of simple yet very clear strategies that can empower somebody and get them the success, plus an empathetic, not overly nice in patronizing, there's a difference there. Patronizing, there yeah. Being nice for Danny. Yeah. The one thing that I forgot to tell you in yeah. the end, the lawyer, we cut the lawyer out. Yeah. He calls me up and he goes, Gail, you are one persistent person yeah. because he would have dragged it on. Those two were fighting all the time. And so I, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about focus, how important focus is. Not that I'm perfect at it, but when you're focused, you're brilliant. Yeah. And, and that, that builds your self-confidence. When you build your self-confidence, you help build your character as well. And that deal for me was like, I mean, it was a huge part of myself that I don't ever think I've ever experienced yeah. as much as I did. In well, that. well, you solved a bigger problem and the bigger problems that you're yeah. able to solve for people, the more empowering it becomes. But like I said to Grant, the real point is for top producers, especially, it's just so easy to be excited about easy. And, you know, Sarah Van, I can talk to you and I can talk now to, you know, Carla, Amanda, I, I see the names of the people that are on here. Um, Jada, I don't know whether you're inside or outside sales, but I can now say to all of you too, the same thing is that you now ha have the challenge of only hearing it, right? And so you eliminate this kinesthetic experience or physical experience where we, we have that benefit of being able to be in the house, see somebody tear up, see somebody go blank. You know, you can see it in your case, you've got this limited place where you can't take these calls for granted, you know, and, and no. the, the challenge becomes your accordion gets squeezed down right? Yes. Your time, yes. the, 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 your, your ability to play the song is more difficult on the accordion because you can only move it so far. Right. But right. but let's go back to this formulaic approach on telemarketing. It's the same okay. concept. And by the way, for, for all you salespeople, a lot of what you're doing is on Zoom and it's on the phone now because you, you can't get in the house. You have to always default to where am I at in the process strategically with this person so that I can deal with the emotion that comes from that. So, for example, the emotional stress that comes when a seller who loves you then goes online and sees on Zillow the wrong pictures or something and freaks out at the very starting point because it's not what they expected or the write-up. Those are very real things, for example, right? So what, what happens when you go from there and you fall off the cliff to the next, right? Well, that's the same kind of uh, you know situation that you have in a house. And it, in telemarketing, it's, it's even more difficult to not take it personally and freak out because it's so easy for somebody who completely doesn't know you it, it, to, to hang up on you, call you a name, take their frustration out on you because there's no, they don't have to make a payment against that. You follow me? Like yes. if, if Jen's friend fires her, she has to make a payment against that. In other words, she's going to see Jen in the general public and it's going to be terse and difficult for a long time, maybe ever. So they're less, they're less likely to do it. Whereas you pick up the phone and you make a phone call, they don't have to make a payment. Click. I don't know you. I don't know who you were. You interrupted me. And so I don't, I don't have to leave anything behind. So you have a more difficult job, which, which makes that first beat in telemarketing. And it doesn't matter what context. It could be a brand new you know, uh, deal. It can be an expired deal. It can be a buyer. It, does, it doesn't matter. It's the, the minimum time that you have to get in there and show somebody that you have a plan for them, that you give them hope. Imagine seven seconds you have to give somebody hope. That's about what it is for you in telemarketing. Whereas in a home, I've got at least 30, 45 minutes. But I think Laura, when she went with me for the first time into a house, and especially Autumn, when she went for, for the first time in a house, I think they were probably very surprised at how very much I stick to the plan. 
And and even when somebody's trying to pull the accordion, these people were making us coffee and tea and do you want this? And they, you know, would get emotional and they jump up and down and run around and one's listening, one's not. And I would just sit there on the corner, staring at both of them, watching them and pulling them back into the plan, watching them and pulling back in. And if it weren't for the fact that I was taking them away from one of their really close friends who had failed on them, okay, it was a done deal, but I just kept drawing them back. So let's go to the call for a second, right? Think about this. The minute you start to fumble and stumble, and I don't have to make a payment um, against hanging up on you. I have no, I might feel bad. You're right. When I click, cause I do it to people. If they call me up and they start babbling, I say, I try once to be nice. Look, I get it, but I shouldn't be on your list. I, I'm not a target. And they keep talking over me. Click. I don't have to make a payment. I did what I was supposed to do and I move on. So you have to understand that. And, and I said this, Kyle, to you, right? Um, I said this very specifically. Uh, when, when Kyle is training his telemarketer to follow up on certain leads, what becomes very important is that that person knows the context right? If I make an offer digitally or I've made an offer to somebody on a referral and I bring it back to either Autumn because it's real raw or Laura because it's referred in and we're already down the line on conversion, I have to give them context. Otherwise, they're going to be, you know, a little bit off. They might be great at picking up on context and figuring out, but maybe, maybe they're not. And I'm making it more difficult. So I would say this to all the team leaders that employ uh, somebody in a, in a telemarketing way. And I say employ te independent contractor work. When you combine your job with their job, what you want to do is you want to say, look, here's the context of the offer we made. And this will help you all run a better business. People are making these bizarre, terrible offers out there on the internet. The internet has prostituted the value of what's being offered as we chase just the acquisition of random inquiry and contact information. So the first thing to do to tighten that up is if that exists, know thy context. This is why when I reinvented my business, I started with expireds. I know the context. I can look at Autumn and say, here's exactly what these people have just gone through. Here's exactly what they're contending with, right? And this is how this is, you know, going to work. So understand that when you call them, every other vulture in the world is dropping down, taking, making it about us, which was the anecdote with Jens, right? The, the, the anecdote is everybody's trying to pick up the phone and take, right? That's what they're doing. You might not think it is. You might think, whoa, but I've been taught NLP and I've been taught how to get them to know me, like me, trust me. Now, that's all fine. And tactically, maybe yes. But why not just be human in that moment to say, hey, right? Question mark. Danny, get them to lean in hearing the humanity of, you know, my name. How do you know my name? Danny, Danny, this is Autumn calling from Griffin Realty Group. And the reason I'm calling is because I saw your beautiful house online and I noticed it didn't sell. So I wanted to send you some information that will help you sell it the next time. May I do that? Danny, this is Autumn calling from Griffin Realty Group. The reason I'm calling is because I saw that you came onto our website and it looks like you were looking for properties in Boston from 400 to 500,000. And I wanted to make sure that when you signed up, you were getting everything that you wanted. And I wanted to see if you wanted to expand the search or add anything. May I help you with that? It just doesn't change. You follow? All that changes is the context. But the way that you interrupt somebody is of service. Now, if they don't know you from Adam or Eve and you're making an outbound, you want to make sure they're very clear that you still know their context from being observant in real estate and that you really do have something that they didn't ask for, but is definitely going to benefit them. That's your offer quote unquote, but how you deliver the offer. So we, we always withdraw first and say, what is the benefit of this offer if it lands on this person? And if I were them with that context, would that be valuable to me? And I think a lot of you in the telemarketing mode are, are not getting connected to that. And, and I've, I've asked the team leaders, if you've been, you know, added to their team and their effort, I've asked them to mail it to you. The team leaders, what you should do is pick up the phone. Amanda, Amanda, this is Danny Griffin calling from Griffin Realty Group and go through it and then mail it. So they know what it's like to ride along the beam of light, 
right? That's how Einstein figured out the law of re relativity. He made it simple. What is it actually like to ride along this beam of light? What's happening here, right? It's the same thing. You always want to ride along your sales process and ask yourself genuinely, if I have this context that this buyer or seller has, is this an enjoyable ride? Or do I want to get off the minute it drops the, the first drop, right? So let me hear from some telemarketer. Oh, go ahead. Somebody want to say something? I heard somebody getting ready to say something or ask. Yeah? No? It was just Dean moving around again. Sorry. Grant, we woke him up again. I hate to do that to him. He and Club are starting to look a lot alike. And Grant, you might be in the same club. You guys are all, all shaving it up tight. All I can see is three shiny heads. Grant, you, yeah, Grant, unmute you. <laughs> Grant, I can see you. You're muted. You got to unmute me. Uh, I was saying high and tight. Yes, yeah, I, I, I like it. A lot of wood chips, Gail. A lot of wood chips on the floor yeah. next next to the barber chair where they go. All three of them, right? Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. Look at Cleva, 2021. He's 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 made, made a pledge. He's, he'll never smile on a sales training call again. He's just his new persona is an angry biker, right? That's who's. <laughs> oh God, that's cool. Hey. A, don't hate because we're beautiful. B, there's a lot of money in that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And look at Cantu shows up because he finds like humor and me beating on all these people. I like it. And he's got hair. He turns on his, he tu yeah, he turns, turns, on his turns on his video just to participate in the beating. I like it. All right. Um, telemarketers, questions, thoughts, a little bit more educational today versus anecdotal, but I think it's important what I just said to you. Are you understanding the value? And, and by the way, team leaders, please do not give any type of lead or contact information to a telemarketer without thoroughly having them understand what offer was made to get that content or not right? Meaning an expired, a probate. We there, we just went out and acquired that information. There's been no offer from our business to them yet. So they're actually making the very first offer. Whereas lead gen, an offer has already been made. It's the first offer and they're calling for fulfillment of that. Autumn, Autumn, it's Danny Griffin calling from Griffin Realty Group. The reason I'm calling is because you are on our website looking for an evaluation of your property. And I wanted to let you know, we were going to send you the first round of information that will help you properly evaluate it. May I send that to the X address? So it's always the same thing, um, depending on what the context is. If it's the first time, it's the very first time they've heard from our business. If it's a lead that's come in, it's not. And this is why I warn most top producers who have gone out and buy leads by the pound, you've never really considered what's been said. And all these knucklehead lead companies say, well, that's proprietary. We're not going to tell you what we say. Really? Because why? You think I'm going to go get an agency to run ads and I'm going to build a software platform? That's how pathetic a lot of these companies are. If they will not tell you what they are saying and what offer they're making specifically, you can never properly have fulfillment ever, ever. You have to understand that, right? Even if you know they just signed into a site that's an IDX site that's giving them properties for sale, you can make, well, they just said properties. You don't know how they said it. You don't know what bloody language they used, meaning bloody, meaning it was bait. It was clickbait or it was just straight up legit, or it offered something that now they're not even looking at. You have to know what's happening for your consumer at every step of the funnel. Um, SV, I'm going to ask you to jump in here, Sarah. Jump in here for a second with me and just tell me, how clear are you when you make these outbound calls, especially on the buy side, about what's been offered them? Any thoughts on this as a veteran? Yes. Yeah, so anytime that we do a new ad, um, Sarah always sends us what the ad looks like because I like to use the same verbiage. That way when I'm connecting with the person on the phone, it kind of rings a bell to, oh, yeah, that's what I was reading, so this is what I'm going to be receiving. So it is very important that I know exactly what that ad said so I know what I'm going to be talking about and one, what kind of information I'm sending them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, cool. Cool. Any thoughts about what happened here today? And Autumn, I'm, I see what you're posting there. I'm happy to go OT. You're going to role play to finish this out. We'll go overtime here today. You there, Autumn? And who are you going to do it with? That's why I said in the beginning, I couldn't remember what you guys were supposed to remind me to do. And that was it. And I'm hearing it at the end. So you were going to role play with who again? Carla? Yeah, Carla, you're on deck next. We're going to end it up with a couple of role plays. Um, you ready? Give the context, no, I, Autumn. Actually, I, 
I did have a very important issue that came up this week, Danny, and Kyle had told me to go over it with you. Go. And see if you can go. help me. Um, so I have obviously a lot of callbacks after the holidays. Yep. I had three or four really uh, strong seller plans that had gone out. I called them back, and they're over 60. All three happened to be. And because of COVID, they decided, oh, no, their voice just dropped. Oh, no. Uh, you know, I, I said I'm following up. I'd like to have Scott stop by, do the free consultation. Oh, that's great, but not now, honey. That's just not going to work with the COVID. You're going to have to call me back in two to three weeks. And then they just went all into uh, the vaccine and they just went all, all right, into All right, hold on. I got directions. it. All right, hold on. Hold on. I got yeah. it. Be resourceful okay. right now. What's an alternative to a live meeting? Well, I said to them, I would love to have, why don't I have Scott give you a call and give some of his input and right. see what he can do for you as far as possibly a zoom call now again I'm, they're over 60 i i i kind of threw it out there and they kind of threw it back at me call me back in two to three weeks okay so what's wrong with that uh nothing i just my only concern was okay obviously i'm i'm trying to build rapport i'm giving them my name and they're writing it down they've got carla carla stop uh -huh. carla carla lots of noise going on in your head right now What's right. wrong with what you did? You have a perception something's wrong with what you did. I asked to see if there was something wrong. You offered a meeting. Right. It right. was not accepted because of COVID. You don't right. downsold to a Zoom meeting. I don't know if you did it right. clearly enough. Say, well, an alternative is we could get them on a Zoom meeting. Have you ever done one of those before? They're fun, period, okay. period. Okay. There's a lot of noise going on here in your head. So I'm wondering how right. noisy it was when it was on the phone, because you already said right. they're older multiple times. So did you add to their confusion? Because it's very simple. Can Scott come over? No, not yet. Two, three weeks. Okay. And maybe they went off a little bit. Well, one cool alternative is we could get him on a Zoom call and he could add some insights now. Nope. Three weeks. No problem. And you're the only right. one that's got a relationship set up that's, that's ready to go in two, three weeks to see where they're at. And what do you do in right. two, three weeks? Sell the appointment. No. Zoom? No. Three more weeks? Yes. That's all you can do, Carla. You're making okay. it about you, right? Just like Jen right. was in that moment. You're making it about you. You're driving the car to white knuckle. You're doing right. a perfect job. So what is okay. the problem in your mind? Right. If you get them to say no too many times, you're breaking all that rapport that you've I like that too. Okay. I, I yeah. think that's really yeah, good right. advice. You're, con okay. you're you're Now you're pressing me. You're pressing me. And I said this to you when I talked to you. I think that the problem is you're pressing so hard to be, and which I like about you, you are an incredibly diligent worker. You care a lot and you're pressing really tightly on the wheel to try to get Scott into these houses. And we have this, you know, a uh, strange moment in time where it's not just somebody 60 plus, it's many people don't want you in their house at this moment in time, especially where California has elevated the awareness of the dangers of it. Right. I mean, right. that's all I, I have, a you know, a daughter in L.A. It's all, you know, the whole theater district, you know, the, the, the play she was at, everything shut down. So it's it's a reality. So you're not going to be able to break through that reality. So just manage that relationship. Look, this is why we have the list management. You put that name on there because that's tomorrow's now business. You follow? Yeah. That's a success. Yeah. You're not celebrating the victory in your mind to recognize you're building a book of business so that three weeks from now, you're calling not only your new people, but you're calling prospects that there's relationship with. And presuming that you've sent the package, you can relate to that. And if it's going to be longer, the down sell from there is get them into the MLS to continue to receive solds and get on the market, you know, update once a month. I mean, you've got to understand the ladder of down cells from the appointment if you weren't able to close it. And the down cells are just like any systematic approach. It's the safety net for the relationship so the relationship doesn't fall through. Now, all you have to do from time to time is call about the properties they're getting, call a, a, about the market update and how you doing. 
with COVID. You doing okay? Everybody okay? Life okay? Yeah. You're bordering on a robotic pain in the ass, right? Right. And like right. De- and like Dean says, you keep pecking away at my head. Are you ready yet? Are you ready yet? Are you ready yet? Don't call me again one day. We'll be and right. then you'll be heartbroken. Right. right. So yeah. so in the beginning of building a book of business as a telemarketer, it's very difficult. Same thing for outside sales agents. You've got to be patient. You can't yeah. you can't change what you can't change. You can change what you can change. Their perception, their understanding, their knowledge, their access to information, all that's within some sort of control. But if what's most important to them is their personal safety and they don't want somebody in the house until they want somebody in the house, great. But you, you've, you've blocked out all the competition if you continue to serve the way you can in the short run. Stop pushing for what yeah. they, they're just not going to accept or you'll be prospects pursued run away. Right. No, you're right. Oh, and on a on a good note. Yeah. Uh, right now, Scott has my one of my appointments. I had sent him on uh, since I've been here in September. Uh, sold actually. It's an escrow. One of my appointments I had sent him on is an escrow as of last week. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Wonderful. Congratulations. Yeah, it's so, fantastic. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Big, thank you. That's so a big sell. Yeah, but but also this one is a, is a success too. That's the one that's in escrow. So you're monetizing and that's the that's really self-fulfilling, right? So yes. yeah. good stuff. Um, Autumn, yeah. I don't think she's on the phone today. That would be Sonia's Carla. I don't see her. Autumn? Okay. Autumn? Autumn, you're mute. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she is. She is not here today. Okay. Yep, she's not. Otherwise, it would have gone OT. All right, final call for questions. Anybody? Thoughts? I just wanted to say all the realtors. I give you guys a lot of credit. You have to be. I was listening to the whole talk today. You have to be very well balanced. Yeah. And I think what you were saying earlier is that sometimes I I think we all do it with nice people. We take advantage without even realizing maybe and the squeaky wheel, the people that are more difficult get more of the attention. Yeah. And I think you guys have to really deal with that all the time. So I give you kudos. That's an ex Carla. That's an excellent point. Um, the negative squeaky wheel gets a lot of grease. You're right. Right. And, and right. I think that's where I was going was we, c- we can't ignore the ones that are, that really love us because they're the ones that are actually way more likely to repeat and refer with us. Right. So, I, so right. I think, I think it's a really important topic, but for you as a telemarketer, it's also important to understand how difficult our job still is when we go in the field to try to tame all of this. Right. So what, what oh, you're, so what you're selling is when you hear all this, you're, you're selling when Scott comes over, he's going to be able to add his insight to your situation which I'll guarantee you, whether you choose to use them or not, is going to be wildly helpful because this is a, you know, it's a pretty complicated process and we want you to be empowered, yeah. right? So the more you can become attached to what you're selling in the field and the more you understand it. And again, when COVID dies down to go and shadow him, for those of you telemarketers that are in the marketplaces where, you know, where, where you can be, um, Russell Maxey, um, do you feel connected to what Duran or one of the other agents would be being in the Philippines. Um, do you, are you getting a better understanding of this too? Because that was one of the things I told Duran that I was going to talk to both of you about um, your your attachment to, you know, the, the really physically what's going on like this. Can you two speak to that? One of you, either of you, Russell, Maxie. I can you hear me. Yep, got you, Maxie. So. After I book a meeting, um, I sometimes feels uh, I, I sometimes feel disconnected when you know after the meeting, um, it it gets sent back to us if you know if, if the if say the prospect has not gotten pre approval yet. So that's where I'm also uh, I, I get confused like what to do because I, I I my my focus is really to you know to push for the offer, push for the meeting, and. Once I'm able to like set up everything, uh, pass it on to the agent or to the to the OSA, and you know they, they put it back to us. My my the dilemma that I get is that what what am I gonna give this prospect or say to them um, 
since you know i'm just really focused on the script that i have yeah yeah for sure we'll see that we'll see that's the problem with having been over scripted after all these years it's too much script and it's not enough service and that's exactly what i talked to Duran about is that I wanted you and Russell because Russell back a couple of weeks ago before the holidays, I remember a moment where it was sort of like you still weren't really feeling connected to the person that you were talking like was my takeaway. That was my takeaway from the situation. Now, Max, you're validating it. So when let me just ask you a question. When something comes back to you from an outside sales agent, what is one of the reasons, Maxie, that would happen? Um, so. Uh, Say for example, it's been you know it's been passed to a lender already, um, but the prospect would not complete the application. Um, then the OSA would tell us uh, if if I ask, hey hey Duran, do we have additional updates for this uh, for this prospect? You've already met with them, have a had a phone phone meeting and all. It has been passed to uh, Team Julie or lender. Um, then they would say they have not gone, you know, they have not finished a pre-approval, uh, go ahead and follow up with them. So the, the, the problem that I, that sometimes it's a problem to me because I don't know what to say anymore. I got it. Oh, well, I, 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 yeah, I got it. I, I mean, the, the only thing you, you, I mean, again, this is a business decision that Duran or somebody has to make is, is that if he's saying to you, I mean, when you go into a script and you ask somebody to get pre-qualified, okay, is that a mandatory part of his system before the OSA takes it over? No. Uh, so, so the meeting already happened with an OSA. Yeah. Then the OSA would tell, um, you need to get pre-qualified by our lender. Um, so if the prospect uh, have gone, uh, like, you know, have, um, have talked to the lender, but have not gone pre-approval process. They throw that back on you like secretarial yeah. work. Yeah. I don't like that. I, I don't think that's sure. right. I don't know I, what I, to say anymore. Well, 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 the only thing you could say in that moment in time is, Hey, can I help you coordinate a time to get with this lender to fill this yeah. out? It's an important part of it. So you have to know the benefit of, of them getting pre-approved is part of that buyer process, right? So the buyer process, if you looked at the, you know, six step buyer process that we put together, the, there's that moment in time that when you go out touring, the reason for having, you know, pre-approval way at the beginning, right? And uh, number one is representation. Number two, the minute I represent you, I'm going to tell you as a buyer, it's prudent to get pre-approved for multiple reasons, but not the least yeah. of which is, you know, what you can buy. Right. Yep. You're so, buying power. right. So, so the benefit of doing this is to zero in truly on what, what you want to spend and what you can spend. So you'd have to be calling them back up saying, look, I know it, it sounds like you, you've maybe had trouble getting a time to get together with the lender. Can I help with that? So you have to go back to being of service to solve the problem that has been thrown back in your lap. I don't know if I like that process. Right. I mean, why isn't the, why is the agent so busy? that they can't get that done, right? That doesn't that doesn't sound like, and, and um, I think Amanda just said it here, it seems like the lender would follow up. Yeah, why isn't the lender following up? It, can, I, can I give my thoughts on this today? Sure, Russell, absolutely. Yeah, so I, there, there's a couple of dilemmas I have with, with these the OSAs and stuff, and it has something to do with that. Like, so something comes back, actually a lot of times, like we gotta hound them to, to get the information. And I sometimes feel like they don't like if it, if it doesn't click on the first call. So well, first of all, we're doing a lot of phone appointments now because of COVID. So um, that's that's what they prefer. Yeah. Um, so like we set a phone appointment, and I think they just call once and they get a voicemail, and then that that's it, you know. And then they don't even tell me like sometimes they'll leave a note. We left a voice message, um, and that's about it. So I don't know how they've been tried more than once or what, but then I, so what happens is I, I call them back and I get a hold of them. So like if we're just going back and forth. Yeah, I'm gonna pass you back on to our OSA, um, and the same thing happens. You know, so it's kind of a weird. I think it. it I don't know if it, it. I think it ruins our credibility um, with with the client. Like, so I'm calling them up. I book something. The OSA for some reason doesn't get through. Then I call them back. And I rebook something and it keeps on going back and forth like that. So I think that's, you know, I have an issue. Yeah, with that. I, I, I think it's a terrible process. I will, let's talk about it next week with him.
Yeah, that's a good thing to bring up. It's a good catch. And see, that's my whole point about bringing this up with all of you. It, the reason why we do the symbiotic call with both telemarketers and, and outside sales agent are being upset, uh, set up like that. Or even if you're doing it yourself, like Jen, if you're calling back so one of Scott's clients who is interested in your services, this whole, this whole smooth system, and especially when you're passing it off to somebody, you, you see what happens, right? You, you, if it's not smooth and you feel like to this person, this is where teams get in a lot of danger. And I'm glad you're bringing it up, Russell and Maxi. Um, number one, you're Maxi, you're certainly under trained in how to deal with it. But my training today should solve it. Keep it simple. What's the problem they threw back on you to get with the lender? Then just simply try to arrange a time. That's it. Don't try to do more, right? If something comes back to you, why is it coming back to me? What's the problem I can solve? Try to use that formula to help you through it, okay? It's got nothing to do with starting all over again. It's simply yep. here. But let's just say, suffice to say, in the beginning, maybe, maybe the way that you two could avoid this from happening is, is understand the benefits deeper of them getting pre-approved and tell them that. Say, look, here's what's going to happen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set you up with the agent. And I know what they're going to talk about as part of this. And it's going to be getting with the lender. Have you been with the lender yet? If not, you know, that's a that's a real important part of what they'll talk about. So make sure you hear what they're saying about that and take those action steps. Maybe you could encourage them. But again, I don't want you doing too much. That's the agent's job. Right. So so my thought is, where's the lazy agent? Where's the lazy lender? Why aren't they completing this? I mean, are they that busy and are they that arrogant? And, and I'm not knocking anybody in your team. I'm saying generically, like, you know what I mean? We need to give everybody a smelling salts moment. Do your job. I mean, this is money sitting here. This is service sitting here, right? Can I weigh on that as well? Yeah, about that, Sarah, the, the Sarah. communication between agents. So yeah. one of the biggest things I find is the same way that we set out plans for buyers and sellers, we have to have a plan with the agents as well as inside sales. Um, so it's that line of communication. Every time an appointment happens, I do check with the agent to see, okay, what what is our game plan? Yeah. So then I know where all my future checkpoints are. Right. Um, I actually had a call this morning with a lady that, I found out from the mortgage broker that she didn't fill out the application yet. So I had to recall her and kind of reiterate the importance of why we want to know where your buying power is, because yeah. there's no point in us jumping in the car and looking at properties or even me setting you up and changing your, your search. If I don't know where they're starting. Well, well was. make so, and, 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 and Sarah really make yeah. it about them, get up under them and saying, look yeah. at it, yeah. it. And it's not, be careful of the language, right? It's not. And this is a really important point here. Be careful of saying, look, it's not even worth our time to do this. I'll, even if you're inclusive in that, you and me say, look, the benefit, if you can all start off by saying the benefit of getting pre-approved is that you will know exactly what you can spend and exactly what you really want to spend. And then we can save you an enormous amount of time in the field by looking at only those things that meet your criteria. And I can also send you some sold property so you can see what that money that you now know you can spend and want to spend actually bought. So just watch the subtleties of the language, Sarah, is the only yeah. thing I would add to that, right? And it, it, it made a huge difference because obviously she still had questions. I right. think she felt a bit of pressure. Right. She's like, well, I don't want to get approved and jump in the car. I'm like, no, no, no. This is just a starting point for us. It's not going to obligate you to making any moving decisions, but let's just start here and know where we have to look. Yeah. And I'll make a huge difference being able to go back. Yeah. And I'll double down on what I said. Make it a game worth playing. Right. Yeah. Because the minute they feel pressured and this is the problem and you know this full well, having worked on now multiple mega teams in Ottawa with a pressure to transact is there and they're still feeling it from you guys. Right. So you're you can come in as the you know, the, as the proverbial white knight, the savior who comes in and says, no, 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 it, there's no pressure. It's just this is the smart way to do it. This is our smart buyer plan. Those buyers that get pre-approved and they, and even if you're just looking online, now you can see what that money matches up with. And I can send you some of those souls before you ever get in the car, right? So you, it's always about the benefit for them and to them for taking the action step you're suggesting. So going back to Russell and Maxie, it's the same thing. When something gets dumped back on them, why? Now, I think something's broken in the process, maybe in both of your companies or teams where, where the, the, the buyer's agent is not doing a good enough job. Their system isn't good enough to ensure that the, this, this happens. And certainly the lenders isn't, right? You give a lender a referral 
and they don't pursue that person with some sort of a follow-up to get pre-approved and they don't express the benefits to them and they take them for granted. Here's where we all get in a tremendous amount of trouble in this business. We're trying to orchestrate so many different parties that, that like we're getting judged based on the lender's crappy follow-up. Where, where is inside sales and telemarketing people getting judged on the crappy follow-up maybe that the outside sales agent does? So we always have to go to process with everybody. You should get all three of you that have spoken about this, Russell, Maxie, Sarah, and everybody else for that matter. You should find out what the lender's process is once it's given, even if you're one position removed. If telemarketing gives it to, you know, the, the, the outside sales and outside sales give it, gives it to lender, you should go around the outside sales agent and say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Lender, tell me your process because I'm the one that's going to fall back on or I'm the one that's going to have to, you know, make sure this gets through. And I want this smooth when it goes beyond me. See, that's the biggest challenge of frustration for people is that, uh, you know, for example, Autumn, I'm extremely cognizant that I should do a thorough job for Autumn. Laura's extremely, you know, cognizant that she should do a very thorough job for Danny and Autumn. Um, Randy's very cognizant that she should do a good job for Laura, Danny, Autumn, right? So we try to all, always constantly smooth out the systematic approach and so that the consumer doesn't feel like it's Keystone Cops. The transfer to the next stage is as seamless and consistent feeling as possible. They get you on the phone. You do a bravo job of telemarketing the, the information. You get them the information, you follow up, you book the appointment. And then all of a sudden there's a very different experience with outside sales. And that happens all the time, right? Danny, what, you know, you know what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a little bit of is like you, you talk about how you have that systematic approach going back and forth. You, Laura, Autumn. Yeah. Because you guys have worked it so well, that system's in place. Would it be possible to get a call with with a combination of outside salespeople, but primarily telemarketers, and have that conversation to kind of create that mid level mind map that we do to say what are the problems, concerns, issues that you have or hear about sure. going back and forth? How much stuff is being pitched back to either you know from the outside salespeople to the telemarketer, which is causing that yeah. Well, well, that Dean, I think we've been doing that on those Thursday masterminds, but yes, you want to pull those assembly line people in and yeah, say, I, you tell us what this is like. What am right, I doing? Not, what am I doing to you? It's not a let's, let's complain and air our dirty laundry. It's yeah. where do you feel challenged or challenges? Yeah. Well, well that's where the opportunity Yeah. And again, I appreciate you. Document that. Yeah. I appreciate you said that. And I don't want this to come off as a bitching and complain about no. team leaders. I mean, they know the difficulties of trying to set this up. I don't want to complain about outside sales agents who haven't been set up that way. You know, I mean, we, we, had just, a, want, we just want to create better communication systems so that we're flawless and going back and forth so that if the outside sales, salesperson and the telemarketer both do have to get tag teaming on a, on a consumer, yeah. that they're coming in from a position of we're both here as partners to help you, yeah. the consumer. Yeah. Let's make sure that we're not irritating that consumer. And Dean, and Dean what I've learned from that Michael Gerber-esque approach is the more the communication improves, the tighter everybody and the simpler yeah. everybody understands what their role is. So I think right. what we, here's an example where you have this debate about whose role it is to ensure that this appointment with the lender takes place. And we've got three potential parties that could be responsible, right? Because if it's getting thrown back on telemarketing, now there's a presumption they have some responsibility. If it was in the hands of the, the outside sales agent and they didn't do it, they have some responsibility. If it was ever even, if the, the contact information was given to the lender, they have it. A decision, a business decision based on a system needs to be confirmed. Let, let's say it's the lender. You go to the lender. That, that's what that's what I'm hearing is, is I'm, I'm kind of hearing the undertones of that's not my job. And I'm not hearing it. hundred percent you are. I'm, but, but I'm not, but I'm not hearing in the sense of that's not my job. I'm not going to do it. It's not what I was hired for. That's not my job because I don't understand that it's my, it's part of my responsibility. It could be, so e it, could, it could be either. And I yeah. think that's precisely why we work so hard on those Thursday calls yeah. to say, all right, let's try to make a mastermind decision. <laughs> about what is this micro job description? As you know, when Autumn came on, we, and, and again, I, 
I've been reluctant to expand into a probate systematic approach because we really, we're not exhausting to its fullest extent the tightness yet. We're, we're pretty close now, but the tightness of the expired approach first. That's how micromanaged I wanted it to be. So it was clear. And what it revealed was that when those deals got down the line, we needed to tighten up the bridge between Randy closing and Laura because we found Laura being so respectful of the people before her that got it to her that she was actually cheating into Randy's job and she was ended up doing that. And, and, and it was more like me that said, whoa, that's not your job. We'll stop doing that and pull yourself back in here. And, and more so, not that they were going to lose anything there, Dean, but but well, the level I, of I, but the I, level I, of service level of yeah. service goes up. And more importantly, what I wanted to say before, sorry to cut you off, but no. the level of service can go higher so that they like her more for what reason? That when they go to Randy and they get beyond and Laura picks back up as past client follow-up, it's right. better there already because it arrives there better. So making it, it's, it's, it's almost like we almost want to blame each other for saying, or the, the system, that's not my job. So what you told me I was supposed to do, are you changing that? And if so, I is it too? I, I appreciate you making the effort, but by making that effort, it may potentially make something worse or create a disconnect with something else. So it, when, when those opportunities come up, it's wonderful that, that you have yeah. people that are motivated to go beyond what they think the scope of their responsibilities are. But yeah. sometimes you got to be careful because you fall into a gray area that could turn into a. And that's trickle down economics, you yep. know, at its at its negative side. It starts from the team leader. Team leader makes a bad decision about how something gets done. You know, it's this Keller Williams problem. Go out and hire an admin. My gosh, is that a frighteningly you know terrible piece of advice, right? Because what it does is it sets somebody up to be the catch-all. So everything now that job description is like 19 pages long because it's everything the team leader who is drowning in work, it wasn't good at, couldn't do, and now starts to go there. So the great news in the, in the world of the micro worker, the micro independent contractor, we're able to say what must get done. And, and when you start to get a little too long, are you starting to border on another uh, skill set? So, for example, you get the telemarketer who's a very specific skill set that is not necessarily the outside sales get, um, skill set at all. I think when Autumn went in the house, she'd far rather be on the phone after she saw what I do. She's like, Ugh, forget that. So, you know what I mean? So, at some point in time, it's like you don't need to have a telemarketer coming in the house other than, for, you know, edification. So they understand what they're doing because that skill set stops. And the same reason I say to, you know, um, I said to Doug Winters, I said to uh, Paul Cantu, you know, stop cheating in, into the telemarketing because that's not your best skill set. There's somebody there that's better simply because that's their number one skill set. Whereas Paul's is being in the house and running the company. So I think we become the problem first. Before anybody else in this call, we as the owner of the team, the company, we, we become the first problem by trying to do too much because we're the ones that give ourselves the job description of, it, it basically says at the top, hire an everything, Dean, right? Uh -huh. You're in everything. I'm in everything. And that's immediately where it breaks. And then the way that we manage it is we just dump and run. And that's then- Between a filing cabinet and a garbage bin. You, you got it. That's, that's a, a, Amen. Perfectly said. Russell, were you going to say something and then we'll wrap this? I, I just want to say, I think uh, as far as specifically on our team, um, I think our problem is it's maybe a lack of protocol or clarity of protocol. Like maybe the OSAs don't understand what our job is. Yes. And they don't like communicate with us. That's right. Um, I think I think we just need to clarify that the protocol. You are right. Uh, and, okay, and, so. Yep. You do this, and you couldn't get a hold of them, or whatever. What, what do I? What am I supposed to do next? Yeah, because I'm always left. I think as ISAs, we're just a lot of times we're left wondering what what are we supposed to do? Yeah, like yeah. To and I, think, to you know, I think that's where the opportunity comes from, Danny, to get everybody on here and say, let's just dump all the dirty laundry on the table. Yeah, so that we so that we as the business owners can look at it and say, okay, where are the opportunities? Where who's who's right and who's wrong without saying you're right and wrong. Mm. But what what are we getting on the table? Right or right? Well, 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 simply what you're doing is what's happening, right. and why is it happening that way? If there's a better way, right? Right. And if, if we as the business owners could, could collectively can come up with solutions 
that not only work but are acceptable and enjoyable to yeah. the INOSAs. Yeah. That becomes that becomes an incredibly powerful system yeah. for everybody involved. Yeah, well I think I, I think one of the solutions, and I'll leave it with this, is the simplification of what we've been doing, you know, especially and this is the reason why I wanted to talk about, you know, um um OSA today. I just think it's lost in a lot of the telemarketers who are here. It's lost as to what it's actually like to be that next person in line. And and you heard Jen's story today and all the emotions and the challenges and the beatings that we take in the field are just as much as it would be on the phone. And we're all mutually empathetic. But if we don't fully understand what each is challenge, you know, each challenge is, we can't more um, appropriately connect them. And if something does have to go back on the assembly line for reassembling, it should be because it, 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 like we didn't see something, it snuck through, whatever. It should be a rarer occasion that that happens over time because the more you can improve each step, the less garbage gets through. It's the quality of an assembly line, right? If you see, hey, we're getting all these um, Model Ts to the end of the assembly line, and for some reason, the front axle is just slightly bent. Well, I'm going to go all the way back into the assembly and say, why is, why is this bent? Well, nobody told me there needed to be somebody on the other side uh, of the assembly line, you know, pushing on it from that side. Well, it was formed. So it's off, it's off a little bit. You know what I mean? It becomes, in other words, the solution almost becomes very clear. If you can just walk back and how did we manufacture and assemble this relationship that we birthed at the end? How do we do it currently? And is that the best way, right? And the only way you can do that is a quality check at the end. I mean, really, we should be doing a better job of surveying past clients. And I don't, I don't mean getting testimonials. That's always self-serving. Surveying, what was it like to go through this? What were the good parts? What were the bad parts? Tell us. Just talk out loud about that process, what it was like. We will, as intelligent, you know, organized business people, hear the ways to improve it, right? All right, enough. See you later. Have a great weekend. Just real quick, real Go quick, Danny and yeah. Carla. I just wanted to say what Dean said. He put it eloquently, very nice. Uh, the communication <laughs> equals confidence. Yep. Communication equals confidence. When you're on the phone, and the more I can communicate with Scott and Kyle, uh, they have been sick, but we're going to start weekly meetings. I emailed Kyle. Yep. Once that gets started, I get to know them more, yep. and everybody's on the same page. Yep. When I have a rebuttal or somebody on the phone, I'm going to be more confident because I've just communicated better with Scott. I know everything, all his in, ins and outs. I need to know more about insight and what he does on his like you said i'm, I'm going right. to be glad to go out with him once COVID's yeah. over. yeah well he can but so he can also the, he can also do a presentation on zoom with you too right exactly so, yep good. yep all right bravo everybody carla, carla carla understand the mindset that i use all the time i don't know the answers to the majority of things but i know somebody who does i live and die by the phrase i got a guy for that yeah and right appreciate <laughs> the fact that you're not trying to blow smoke up their exactly yes i like what you said don't give him too many compliments at the end of a yeah. call because then, Listen, th then Gail, then Gail, the then Gail and I have to manage his ego for the rest of the week. Oh, okay. So yeah. So yeah. thank, Going thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. See you later. Good work, everybody. Bye -bye. Ciao. Bye -bye. Thank you.